Uh, now we are going to understand how to identify companies in their early stage. Uh, as we all know, we all know that growth is never by mere chance. It is a result of consistent perseverance. But with the but the but with this fast moving world, we are hustling. In, where hustling is the new cool, it has become more difficult to identify who is con constantly moving in the right direction. To understand how we identify companies in their early stage, we have with us Mr. Sunil Singhania, founder at Abacus Asset Managers LLP. Abacus Asset Man Manager LLP is an alpha-focused asset manager invest asset management investing investing firm in India, founded in 2018 by Mr. Sunil Singhania. Sunil Singh, Mr. Sunil Singhania has over two decades of experience in Indian equity. As ex chief investment officer of Reliance Mutual Fund, he oversaw around 11 billion USD of equity assets. He is currently appointed on the IFRS Capital As Capital Market Advisory Committee. Now I'm handing over the mic to Mr. Vikas Agarwal, who will in turn be handing over the mic to Sunil Singhania. Yeah, thank you, Pragya. Uh, hello, Sunil. Uh, Sunil, sir, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, loud and clear. Okay, great, great. So, firstly, thank you so much for accepting our request and taking the time out from your busy schedule. Uh, online is very convenient. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right. So, basically, sir, this uh, whole idea of organizing this AIF and PMS conclave is to educate and empower the investor community as a whole. And what we are witnessing is that, I mean, you know the fact that globally, AIS and PMS industry as a whole is shaping up very well. And we see huge value migration happening in this industry also. A lot of people are keen to invest in PMSs and participate in basically capital markets too, these two vehicles. So we thought who would be the better person than you to talk about that. Uh, and uh, basically the agenda of the discussion today is to uh, talk about because at Abacus, you know, you bring about now almost four years of consistent track record in terms of beating the benchmark uh, or perhaps the, the, the best in terms of performance. I mean, nobody would have outperformed. So the point here is that uh, uh, at, at Abacus, like at an organization, you have two different philosophy. You have a sort of multi-cap strategy and the other one is mid and small cap strategy where you prefer to identify some companies at an early stage of their growth curve and right through their growth journey. So we want to discuss about that first and then maybe if you can share your valuable wisdom with us in terms of outlook of the equity markets. Over to you, sir. No, thanks a lot, uh, uh, Vikas, and thanks uh, AIF PMS. I think you have been doing a wonderful uh, I think effort to, to you know take the AIF and PMS uh, industry to the investors. Really, really thankful to you because we also benefit out of it. Uh, I think the broader and the deeper the markets, uh, it's good for all the investors, including including all of us. Uh, coming uh, to the uh, topic, identifying companies at an early stage. Obviously, it is very easy uh, in hindsight to say that you know you identified this and you identified that. Uh, obviously, it is very difficult to say that you know uh, these are the criteria which uh, uh, which are sure shot. Uh, I would say tick marks uh, to identify a company. But uh, what I can try and do is out of experience, what has worked for us, that is what I can share. Uh, and as you rightly said, I'll give five, seven minutes of my view on the on the markets. It's a short session, so I'll try to be to be short at the same time, a little bit, uh, you know, fast, so please pardon it. So see, one yeah. thing is whenever you are looking at equity, you have to look at the underlying economy. And whether you are looking at mid cap, large cap, small cap, I think ultimately what you have to see is whether the underlying economy is growing. And more important is the, this uh, when you are looking at the, the mid and small cap or the broader economy. Uh, you know, so I think uh, coming uh, first is that India offers an economy which is growing quite meaningfully. You know, it took us 60 years since uh, 1947 to 2007 to reach a trillion dollar in economy. The second trillion happened in nine years. The third trillion happened in six years. So in uh, 75 years, we have reached three trillion dollars in economy. And that was the kind of wealth which was created by equity investors. The next three trillion will take only seven to eight years. So the wealth which we have created cumulatively in the last 75 years will be created in the next seven to eight years. I think why this is important is twofold. One is the outlook on equity market is very positive. And when $3 trillion of wealth is going to be created, the opportunity available to companies, entrepreneurs across sectors is immense. So it is very, very important that this growing economy 
is one tick mark when you look at companies, even small companies. Second is India offers a very diverse economy. Now, we are not like Russia, which used to be only oil and gas, or Brazil, which used to be only commodity, or China, I call it only PSU. I think India has presence in IT, pharma, manufacturing, auto, uh, digital, you know, cement, infra, utilities. We are very, very diverse. And I always say this, you know, India grows because of entrepreneurs and despite the government. We have so many listed companies and so many companies getting listed year after year. I think what it does is it ensures that one, the growth rate in the economy is very vibrant. It's not dependent on a few groups. It's, you know, thousands and lakhs and crores of entrepreneurs. Second is an investor. You keep on getting uh, opportunities every year to invest in new entrepreneurs, new sectors, new themes which again is very, very important, particularly if you want to identify company at an early stage. The third most important thing is that we are an economy and a, and a country where we have a young population. And therefore, the aspiration level and the, uh, and the, you know, the, the kind of consumption which we are looking at is very different. You know, uh, when I was young, we used to get two or three shirts during Diwali and that was it. Or if there are two or three brothers, then everyone's clothes are one. You know, that was the kind of consumption we used to have at that point of time. Now we are looking at a very different kind of consumption. You know? I think uh, buying clothes is uh, not an occasion, it's an instinct. You go to a mall, you like something, you pick it up. I'm just saying this because in a growing economy with a young population, growing income, the choice of businesses have increased many fold. Earlier there used to be no concept of uh, office wear and Sunday wear and eth ledger and uh, ethnic wear. Sab jaga ek hi kaam tha. Ek suit hota tha, wo office mein bhi ohi suit pehnte the, shadi mein bhi ohi pehnte the, aur kithar jana hota tha, ohi ohi pehnte the, aur sardi mein bhi ohi pehnte the. Now for every occasion we have different things. So I think these are very important because this will lead you to identify companies at an early stage. The other thing is uh, entrepreneurship in India is flourishing. So even when I was doing CA, the options used to be to look for a good company mein job. Kar. Or when, when uh, you know, kids used to go abroad, the whole agenda was that we will get a good job in the US and we'll settle down. Now it is very different. I think young kids are uh, studying. Obviously, a lot of them would go into employment, but many of them now want to become entrepreneurs. Startup culture is there, entrepreneurship is there. And I think that would again mean that there is an opportunity to invest in these budding entrepreneurs. Other thing is that the risk-taking ability has increased. You know, earlier, again, the young guys wanted stability. And that was largely because we grew out of a very middle-class background. You know, when we got our independence, our fathers and forefathers used to focus only on roti, kapda and makan. Okay, you know, family ke liye food mil jaye. Now that is taken care of and therefore the young guys have that uh, risk-taking ability to get into businesses and which is again, you know, that is going to lead for us to have opportunity to invest at an early stage. And along with this risk-taking ability is also coming the availability of risk capital. So this whole concept of angel funding, family offices, venture fund, PE funds, International, international funds, local funds, they are all available. You know, uh, So many startups get funded. We have TV shows where they are getting funded. Uh, you know, A lot of them become successful. So I think all this means, along with a vibrant capital market, that the opportunity in a growing economy like India to invest in companies at an early stage is very, very high. Uh, and I think uh, that I would like to begin with that, that one, there is a huge opportunity to, to invest now in early stage companies. The other thing is, uh, you know, you have now what you should look at uh, when you want to identify companies. So, particularly when you're looking at smaller companies, the most important three things are as follows. One is obviously promoter. Because a smaller company is promoter dependent company. In a large company, you have executives you know, who have uh, the requisite uh, uh, credentials, qualifications, experience, who are uh, paid well and they can act like really these senior guys. In smaller companies, you know, they can't afford 
uh, very high uh, salaried employees and therefore the whole onus comes on the promoters or the founders and therefore when you look at companies at an early stage i think the capability of the promoter the honesty of the promoters and the passion to grow of the promoters has to be very very high and that has to be the first stigma the second is obviously the sector or the team they are working on uh, you know if it's a very very small sector even if you get the best promoter the potential of that sector the company growing beyond a particular size is going to be limited so the the sector has to have a scalability and a profitability approach uh, we are at abacus very value conscious investors we invest only in companies which make profit where there is visible profit growth and what we pay today should be more than repaid by your future profitability and that is whether it is a mid cap or a small cap or a large cap i think that is sacrosanct for us so for us when we look at even early stage company it is whether the sector has the capability of making profits and the scalability and last is the size of opportunity you know whether the promoters along with the sector potential has in it to achieve the size of opportunity because you know one thing you have to remember when you are investing in companies at an early stage your return expectations are very high because obviously the volatility and to some extent the risk is also high so unless you have that visibility of making quite high returns why would you get into some smaller and therefore all these three things become very very important you know now even when you look at early stage companies or small caps or mid caps i think there are two types of companies which can come in one is there is an existing sector market and a new company comes in they either have a some usp where they can compete with the existing company and grow faster the other option is that you know you start a new business which has never been thought by anyone and you create that business so whenever you look at an early stage company i think these two things have to be Uh, thought about that whether it's a company which is already competing with someone who's established but they have in them to grow faster than the established company or they are coming and creating a separate market like netflix came out of nowhere and they created a separate market or you know even the, the new age businesses in ica they came out of nowhere and started competing with the established players or even zomato and swiggy you know we are not saying that they are good investments or not i'm just giving you an example of how they created yeah they they basically those businesses did not exist at the same time there are companies which come in businesses which are already existing but they start to grow faster so in footwear bata was an established player but the new age businesses came and they started you know providing designs which were very different and they grew started growing faster or you know out of nowhere manyavar came and created a niche for ethnic wear before that ethnic wear was not supposed to be a separate segment you know the old age companies they were caught by surprise that how only by selling ethnic wear someone can create a 30000 crore market cap company so when you are looking at uh, early stage companies all these things have to be basically taken into and as i said you know india is a growing economy there are a lot of new sectors coming in and some of the, the recent successes you know i mentioned ethnic wear been a recent success it started small inner wear company like page industry they started small we have ems companies like dickson and amber who started so small but they had a new business and they came out of nowhere so if you would have done the research that you know for foxconn can be 100 billion dollars why in india some company cannot be 1 to billion dollars the size of opportunity was so huge or even in tech and pharma you know you come out with a niche uh, tech solution or a niche pharma play you know you you basically work on a niche therapy or even now you know there is a multiple uh, city of dtc brands direct to consumer brands and we have some uh, shoe companies which have got listed uh, some uh, you know garment companies which have got listed on the uh, on the private equity side we have uh, the likes of lenscart and so many others who have created a niche out of of nowhere 
you have fintech companies which have come up you know it was supposed to be uh, the uh, you know the finance was supposed to be done in the old age manner but there are now so many companies which are which are only on digital platform you know and the and the likes of zerodha and all they created uh, businesses out of nowhere last two, three years you know it was it's a kind of fintech and then you have also some new age uh, companies which are trying their luck like uh, you know tv plays or drone plays and so on and so forth so i think in short whenever we look at uh, companies uh, at an early stage all these characteristics have to be there you know um, Uh, so there is an opportunity definitely in india because it's a growing economy it's a diverse economy there is a lot of entrepreneurship but when you look at it you have to look at promoters uh, the sector scalability and the size of operation this would be the prerequisites now how do you basically identify so few things which we which have worked for us obviously first is whenever you look at a smaller company and uh, you know you basically look at it and say whether this can really give you disproportionate return i think the first thing which we look at is this belief uh, what do you believe and what does the market not believe because where there is disbelief things really really work well if you go right so you know what is market price because market price is equal to eps into p eps is the profitability of the company p is the percent if only profitability increases you will make returns in line with the profit growth but if profitability increases along with perception you have a multibagger impact so suppose if there is a company which doubles its profit and where the pe also gets double the stock price will become four x so i think things where there is disbelief are things which are at least when we look at it Uh, we see that where there is disbelief and where we believe that things can be much better than what the market is looking at second uh, thing which we look at when we say the scalability and the size of opportunity is whether at some point of time in the distant future the profit of the company can be equal to the current market so in a long back we had a huge stake in bajaj finance you know the market cap at that point of time when we started buying when i was in reliance mutual fund was 5 600 crore rupees only yeah less than 1000 crore yeah yeah and at that point of time our view was that in 4 years this company will make 500 crore of net profit so technically sometime in the very near future we were looking at one piece uh, you know obviously we sold also early so it's one of the regrets <laughs> also but what i'm yeah. trying to say is market cap at some point of time should be equal to the pat as far as the company is concerned a lot of times you know companies uh, expand a lot and they have huge uh, non cash uh, uh, expense items like depreciation and all so another good way of looking at it is cash earning of the company you know uh, rather than looking at eps whether can you look at the cash earnings of the company and then related to the market cap and the size of it So if you come across companies where you know the cash earnings is very high, that means the companies are going to sustain. And then you know if you have one good year, you will have a huge. The other thing which we look at is how much is already been spent on capex. So the balance sheet has already expanded, but the benefit of that balance sheet expansion has not yet got percolated in the PNL. So in some sectors, you know where there is lumpy capex. what i mean by lumpy capex is like you know you have to spend a lot of money at one point of time and then the result comes after 2 3 years when the capex comes online so the balance sheet is already expanded but it has not got converted into the pnl and whenever that expanded capacity comes into production you know your pnl also starts to expand and you start to see huge benefits you know so again that is one uh, one key uh, thing which we look at uh when we look at early stage so i think just to summarize the early stage before i give 5 7 minutes of my view on the market is that there is huge opportunity to to invest in mid and small caps in india because it's a growing economy we have presence across sectors lot of entrepreneurship lot of passionate entrepreneurship and lot of new business is coming in in the market you know we have an investment in a company which is into lounge management now this business did not exist for a long uh, for uh, like 
know, uh, till two, three years back. We have an investment in a company which is into uh, SMSs uh, and, uh, you know, uh, WhatsApp uh, response because nowadays all this chatbot and all have come into play. This business did not exist for five years back. Now you have that. So, you know, uh, with this growing economy and a changing economy and the disruptive, uh, uh, I would say, sectors which are coming up, the potential is huge. But from our side, we only invest in profitable companies. So a lot of these new age businesses, even if they are very exciting at an early stage, uh, we frankly stay away from it because we don't understand those businesses. So this would be my take on uh, on uh, companies at an early stage coming to the markets and the yeah, economy. Yeah, how to go to market. Right. So, uh, so I'll, I'll, I'll give my perspective not more than five, seven minutes because I'm very sure other guests have also already given uh, quite a bit of their thought and, uh, you know, more often than not, uh, some of these thoughts would be similar. But uh, uh, coming straight, uh, I think uh, the global uh, economy according to us, the second half of 23 would be much better than what it has been over the last, uh, you know, uh, at least 18 months. And our, uh, uh, the confidence is because of the following reasons. One is inflation, which had shot up post the Russia-Ukraine war, is now definitely inching down. And just to give you a small example, suppose the inflation index in May 2021 was 100. In May 22, it became 120 because post the Russia-Ukraine conflict, all commodities, whether it was metals or energy or, you know, uh, uh, food, everything shot up. There, we have already seen massive correction. You know, oil from 130 is down to 80. Metals are down 30, 40 percent. Uh, you know, food prices are back to normalcy. And by base effect, uh, as of May, June 23, even if the current price is sustained, inflation in the U.S. should be almost non-existent. And therefore, I think interest rates, our view is that they have already peaked. And second half, we should start to see uh, a, a view coming up of even interest rates being uh, reduced rather than increased. Uh, we saw some upheaval uh, even in the first quarter because of uh, what happened to the Silicon Valley Bank and other regional banks and also credit suites. But interestingly, it happened in May. And May, all global markets ended positive after falling very sharply in the first 10, 15 days of the month. You know, in fact, NASDAQ went up 6, 7% for the month. Yields in the US and rising yields was a reason why Silicon Valley Bank failed. It did not uh, fail because of uh, bad lending. It uh, failed because of uh, mark to market on uh, yields going up. Two-year yields from 5% fell to 3.75%. Ten-year yields from 4% fell to almost 3.35%. They've inched up a little bit now, but they're still significantly lower than where they were. And interestingly, India, which normally goes uh, in a tailspin when something happens. So, you know, you always have this, that when the world sneezes, India goes into a coma. In 2008, when Lehman happened, currency depreciated by 30% almost overnight. Yield shot up majorly. The same thing happened in 2013. But this time, after the Silicon Valley Bank issue, we in fact have rupee which is appreciated from 83 to almost 82. Our yields are down from 7.4% to 7.2%. And in fact, post that, foreigners have become more positive on India than negative. And we have started to see small flows, but positive flows after a long time. Uh, RBI has already taken the call of, uh, uh, you know, uh, at least temporarily uh, stopping the interest rate increase. Nothing, and that is also being reflected. Lastly, from the global side, I think we had a very strict China zero COVID policy, which was slowing down uh, global growth. We have seen the reversal of it. The impact of it is still not being felt, but it is expected that even Chinese economy, which had the growth had fallen to 2-3%, should now start to grow at 5-6%, which again would be a helping hand as far as the global uh, uh, GDP growth is concerned. So all in all, I think 23 is going to be positive uh, compared to where we were as far as the world is concerned. From India's perspective, India benefited out of the four Ds. One is democracy, 
I think the world realized that if it's a, not a democracy, then something which happened in Russia or something which can happen in China is also a possibility. So funds are now moving more towards the democratic countries. Second is the demographics. I mentioned I touched upon this a little early, you know, earlier also. We have a median age of 29 years. It is going to be around 30 at least for the next 20 years. And that presents India to be one of the most resilient in terms of uh, GDP growth. Third is uh, the domestic economy. So in 2022, the world was debating whether they will grow at 0% or negative growth. In India, the debate was whether we will grow at 6% or 7%. And I think that was a great debate to have. Uh, and India ended up growing at 6.3%. And even the outlook for the next two years is pretty decent. Last is the digital economy. We lag massively in terms of physical infrastructure. There also there is huge progress being made. But I think we have compensated that to a large extent by way of the progress we have made on the digital infrastructure. This tax collection of 20% and all is largely because of the huge compliance uh, due to the digital infrastructure and the increase in efficiency. And I think this 4D will ensure that GDP in India grows at 6-7% and uh, we would be among the fastest growing economy in the world. Lastly, on the valuations, I think we had become very expensive towards the end of 21, almost 24-25 times. In the last six quarters, we have added almost 25% in earnings. And there has been a correction in the broader markets of 10-12%. So on a PE basis, we are now back to 18 times FY24 and almost 16 times FY25, which is at a 10-year average. So we are not negative. Uh, I would not say we are not uh, uh, very cheap, but we are not very expensive also. All in all, our view is that 18 months returns have not been made. We are in a phase where the next two years can be pretty decent as far as equity investments is concerned. But again, you know, our focus would continue to be on companies where there is visible profit growth. Because, uh, you know, again, in the last two, three, four hundred years of history of investing globally, that is the only thing which has worked very consistently. So this is a short thing on the topic we gave and the market. Uh, I think we have four or five minutes. Uh, I'm very happy to answer any questions at this point. Of time. Sure, sure. So thank you so much for en enlightening us with your thought process, sir. The first question is, do you think FIA is coming back to India? No, I am very positive on that front. In fact, uh, last six months, the kind of, uh, of uh, I would say, interactions we are having uh, with uh, global investors has been in unpaired. Uh, and, you know, uh, in between 2003 to 2008, there were a big move towards India-specific funds or India-country-specific funds. I think post Lehman, that went away. Uh, we are seeing now the signs of that re-emerging. Uh, and, you know, uh, again, in our interaction with global investors, uh, we are seeing their move to to look at India uh, independently. Because, you know, China, obviously, everyone was overweight. And now they are getting a little bit worried about what is happening in China. And uh, um, our view is 2023, on a yearly basis, should have a major positive growth from foreign investors. All right, so with that, we'd like to conclude the session here uh, because we are running short of time. So thank you so much for your uh, valuable insights, sir. And thank you so much once again for taking Pleasure. time. Thanks a lot uh, and best wishes. Thank you.